it would be a mistake just to see him as, as, as this kind of Irish poet who just speaks to Irish people. He's very much an international figure. That's where he, uh, he takes his influences from all over the world. The, the circle that he moves in is very much international and global. Listening to his voice, he's got an amazing voice. I don't know how many writers or poets you could say that when they deliver their own material, it's just as fantastic as you reading it or visualizing it in your head when you're reading it alone. And his voice is incredible. His haunting voice with Perth Mabuki reading that poem is just, it, it's hypnotic. Uh, I came to Dublin in 1969, and over the years, um, I acquired the, the Little Faber and Faber. Uh, publications of the collections as, as they organically grew and um, they accompanied me uh, I suppose right through my life here in the city um, uh, through many dingy cold water bedsits and dusty flats with uh, high ceilings and dry rot and uh, I found that sometimes in, in, a, in a world where you are initially only finding your feet, or sometimes it seems very strange, they, they steady you. If the axis of the world ever feels like it's tilting, a Heaney poem will put your feet straight back on the ground. A call. Hold on, she said, I'll just run out and get him. The weather here is so good, he took the chance to do a bit of weeding. So I saw him down on his hands and knees beside the leak rig, touching, inspecting, separating one stalk from the other gently pulling up everything not tapered, frail and leafless, pleased to feel each little weed root break, but rueful also. Then found myself listening to the amplified grave ticking of hall clocks where the phone lay unattended in a calm of mirror glass and sunstruck pendulums, and found myself then thinking, if it were nowadays, this is how death would summon every man. Next thing he spoke, and I nearly said I loved him. Bill Clinton fell in love with the words of Seamus Heaney because they were so reflective of being on the cusp of something not only brilliant and not only important, but something that was life-changing even today. Uh, we saw there not so long ago, St. Patrick's Day, uh, the Taoiseach Brian Cowan delivering to President Obama another articulate, well-read, a great hope politically for people. Um, it, uh, Brian Cowan delivered copies of the books that Seamus Heaney has written of poetry, uh, including a translation of Beowulf. And the quote, I think that, uh, as far as I understand, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn here, but I think that Seamus Heaney admires Barack Obama. And the line that, that springs to mind is the one about, you know, a man who comes in an hour of need, there was no one else like him alive. And, I mean, no pressure, Barack, but you get the idea. When he talked about the writing of uh, his version of uh, Antigone, and just to hear his thought process and to marry it with the rural Ireland with which he's very familiar and to, to, to capture those two traditions, the Greek tradition and the Irish tradition, both in theatre and in culture and, and how we are as a people and the, the likes and, and the, the, the similarities and those that are not similar to the Greeks or whatever, was fascinating to get an insight into his brilliant mind. And one of the great things that I love about Heaney is that when he talks and given that he is one of the, the great writers of not only this time but any time to hear his sense of humility as he just talks away and you know he said uh, he read from his speech but he said uh, I hadn't got time to be brief to quote one of the other great writers of our time so to, to get an insight into the mind of a great writer like Heaney and to see how he approaches the discipline of his work and he's very particular about the stress of every syllable how it should be played and I think that's what Patrick Mason did in that production uh, of Burial at Thebes uh, at the Peacock fantastic work The Clothes Shrine It was a whole new sweetness in the early days to find light white muslin blouses on a see-through nylon line drip drying in the bathroom or a nylon slip in the shine of its own electricity. As if St. Bridget once more had rigged up a ray of sun like the one she'd strung on air to dry her own cloak on. Hard pressed Bridget. So unstoppably on the go. The damp and slump and unfair drag of the workaday made light of and got through as usual. Brilliantly. 
I was a young, raw lad from Leitrim uh, in my first year in UCD. And uh, Heaney came to me along with Sylvia Plath and Ted Hughes. And to be honest, I was probably more appreciative of them at the time than I was of Heaney's work. Because in a strange kind of way, I think uh, the world, the terrain, was almost too familiar to me uh, growing up in Leitrim and, and Heaney from Derry, that I didn't see what was there in front of me. And it was years later that I came back uh, and opened a book like North and, and saw the power of it. This guy to my left and the older brother as well were really into things like theatre, or well, maybe not so much you, books, etc., literature, but poetry was number one on the list, and Seamus Heaney was the number one main man. And here's my little point about that. One thing I always remember is this. You'd have one of them coming home, and I can't remember which one, it was probably you, saying, look what I got for Christmas. I got um, the first edition of the new Seamus Heaney work. <laughs> and the other guy would go, look what I've got. I've got a first edition as well, signed by Seamus Heaney. Beat that. I can't remember who it was. Was it you lost or he lost? Can't remember I nearly one. always won. Anyway, the two of them are uh, absolutely nearly obsessed. Always. So that's how it would trickle down to me. My English teacher was fantastic in secondary school. Her name was Miss O'Keefe and she had a great love for Heaney's work and I suppose she passed it on to all of her students, including me. She used to say that he was a true hero um, for poetry. I went to a book launch early 70s and met Seamus Heaney. And we were involved in a magazine in UCD called St. Stephen's. And I said to him, would you give us a poem? And you don't really expect a guy who's going to reply at a place like that or give you a poem. So we had corresponded previously. So about, I suppose, a couple of weeks, maybe even months later, I got a letter from his Wicklow retreat apologising for how long it took him to send the poem. I was delighted. And then he said, sorry, but my typewriter has been broken. And I thought it would be fixed in time. So do you mind if I do it in longhand? <gasps> so eBay. I said, uh, I didn't think of eBay at the time. I don't think eBay was around. <laughs> I don't think time. it was around. But time. either way, I said, brilliant. Now, the poem wasn't collected for a, at least one collection after that. So I said, even better. I now have a poem that's not even and in the collection. It's collected a word for like a collection of the poem. Yeah. That's what nobody did. They were like, no. That's what a courier coming to get. No courier came, oh, no. And, um, but it did appear anyway in field work. It's called A Drink of Water. It's a very nice poem. But there are slight differences in the poem that appears in Fieldwork. So I still have the letter from Seamus Heaney, and I'm delighted with myself. It's a father and son type relationship. The father is working away, ploughing within the fields, because they originally were from a, a dairy agricultural background. And the father is ploughing away, and the son is there, the son presumably being Seamus himself. He's, he's a nuisance. He's a hindrance. He's not a help at all. But the father's tolerating him. He's putting up with him, you know? And then as the poem progresses, and then we get to that last verse, the roles are completely reversed. And he's now, he is, he is the plough. He is driving the plough. And he's, he's not looking in, in front of him. He's looking behind him. He's looking behind him at this frail old man who is his father. There are obviously so many poems that I love that James Heaney has written, but one that really stands out, one of his first ones, I suppose, is um, Midterm Break. I sat all morning in the college sick bay, counting bells knelling classes to a close. At two o'clock, our neighbours drove me home. In the porch, I met my father, crying. He had always taken funerals in his stride, and big Jim Evans saying it was a hard blow. The baby cooed and laughed and rocked the pram when I came in, and I was embarrassed by old men standing up to shake my hand and tell me they were sorry for my trouble. Whispers informed strangers I was the eldest, away at school, as my mother held my hand in hers and coughed out angry, tearless sighs. At 10 o'clock, the ambulance arrived with the corpse, staunched and bandaged by the nurses. Next morning, I went up into the room. Snowdrops and candles soothed the bedside. I saw him for the first time in six weeks, paler now, wearing a poppy bruise on his left temple. He lay in the four-foot box as in a cot. No gaudy scars, the bumper knocked him clear. A four-foot box, a foot for every year. For me, when I read it the first time, I could just see 
everything so clearly and the resonance of midterm break was that I had a child who died of my own um, and I ended up carrying that white coffin and I thought of that poem so often and it just it just created something even from the time I was 14 and I just have to say thank you so much for giving me the most wonderful poem ever thank you Seamus I'm interested in the way he encapsulates uh, very important events in history, in the history of Ireland uh, initially, obviously, uh, and then a broader canvas. But uh, in, in terms of the history of Ireland, uh, I, I'm particularly fond of the, the poems that uh, allude to uh, the famine, uh, the Great Famine, and also uh, because I am a Wexford woman, uh, secondly, but primarily because it's a wonderful poem, The Requiem for Croppies. And thirdly, I'm particularly attracted to the poetry uh, about Northern Ireland. I, I happen to have a great love for Northern Ireland. I'm intrigued by the idea of, say, the city of Belfast, where, you know, you have a city that's beautifully set in the shadow of the Black Mountain, yet, you know, within earshot of the tinkle of the gantries, there's a, there's a great contrast there. I love the cadences of the speech. I love the slender vowels. I love the broad, uh, the broad uh, way of speech when you go into the heart of the country, in many ways very like the heart of the country in my own county, Wexford. Uh, I, I happen to feel a, a grow and an empathy with Northern Ireland. So uh, on, uh, on all those three fronts, it's, it's actually a very basic thing with me. I wouldn't for a moment presume to intellectualise it. I simply love it. It resonates with me. It strikes a chord. It can bring tears to my eyes. Interviewing him for uh, the art show in November when uh, Dennis O'Driscoll published Stepping Stones, that wonderful book of interviews with Heaney, was a joy and a privilege. And he's personally, he's extraordinarily warm and generous and giving, but he's as sharp as a hair in summer. You, know, you watch him and you realize you're being watched as well. Uh, and you know, you, you can't make a slip because he never does. He's a good ambassador for the whole idea of poetry and what it's, what it's about and what it can achieve. And I think, you know, as well as the poems themselves, it's worth reading, you know, his lectures, his prose work, and it's certainly worth attending any lecture he gives. I, I went to hear him speak at St. Patrick's College a couple of years ago about Kavanagh, and it was wonderful, and everybody left the room feeling that they'd just been nourished by something. You know, so, you know, th there aren't many like him around, and we ought to listen to him. I had a lovely poem sent to me, uh, by Iggy McGovern, uh, a poet and physicist who's, who's based in Trinity, a ode to, to, to Seamus for his 70th birthday. And it's great because it finishes up saying, uh, 70, 70 years are growing ever young. And I, I think that's, that's lovely because it, it captures something as well, I think, of, of the spirit of Heaney, which is eternally youthful. There's something of, of Sweeney in there as well, in, in Heaney himself. Uh, this spirit that is never dulled, can't be quenched, will go on, uh, will go on right into the future and brighten uh, those, those darknesses, brighten those bogs as, as the lights did in, in the past. Uh, there's nobody like him and never will be. Be call in the Gael Eddy Evan Yonder, good skill, your thanks. John the Seher Seamus Heaney Kinch, a Gamada and Tradition Shin, Bill Aguni. Today, same with Lesh, a good Seagrasach, a good Hunkin, and Alain's Tirsha Agas Haryar. Call Gorgeous.